I'm Alicia Benjamin here for Cal TV, and I'm here with one of arguably the most iconic DJs in history, Norm McCook, aka Fatboy Slim, ahead of his show tonight in Oakland. Let's say somebody has been under a rock for the past 30 years. Yeah. Who is Fatboy Slim? Fatboy Slim is a, uh, a fictional character that I assume to allow myself to escape from um, reality for a few hours uh, using loud uh, acid house music flashing lights, squelchy noises. Uh, yeah, no, it's just my DJ and pseudonym. I make rec well, I used to make records, don't really anymore. Uh, and I travel around the world playing tunes to people and trying to make them smile and dance. The, the 90s are kind of seen as a, like a golden period for dance music and dance culture. Do you think that we're looking back at it with rose-tinted nostalgic lenses or was that really the time and how does that compare to now? Oh, no, I don't think you're looking through, through those tinted glasses. It actually really was that good. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> it was fabulous. I'm so jealous. Yeah, no, but I mean, I, did, I, but I don't know. I, but I would say it's still fabulous now. Yeah. Um, I don't know that it was any better than now. I mean, it was better for me because I was younger and, you know, the, and, and things were new and different. The way I see it is that, like, young people will always have this desire and or actual need to go out and get high and get laid and you know and dance and that's what young people do and probably from when we lived in caves people you know just <laughs> want young people and so um there's something quite timeless about it there was this kind of more of a feeling of community and, and yeah. brotherhood and that we were kind of i don't know that we were this new tribe yeah but that was only just because it was it was new and it was different now people are the same tribe and, and you know, clubbing. I think clubbing is just as, as healthy as it ever was. A lot of people view you as one of the most influential DJs ever. What is your relationship with fame? With fame? Well, it's, it's nothing really to do with me being a DJ. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it wasn't the reason I got into it. When I started DJing, DJing wasn't even a career. It was just like a hobby that people yeah. who bought a load of records did to finance their, their, their habit of buying records. Okay, I was doing really well until I met my wife. Oh. So <laughs> now for you, those Americans, Zoe was like, at the time, the most famous TV. She did the Radio One breakfast show. And when, and I was kind of at the height of my career. So when we got together, we were like this sort of- Power couple. <laughs> Anti-power couple. <laughs> and with that came phone. But what I really quickly noticed was before that, I'd been sort of well known for being for the music I made and what I did. Yeah. But the only people who recognised you were people who liked you. Oh, and they'd come up and go, oh, I like your record, or can I have an autograph or something like that. When you get famous, everyone recognises you whether or not they like you. Oh, and that's not so quite so nice. And it, uh, often mm -hmm. it's quite unpleasant. And yeah, I've never really chased that kind of fame. It's mm -hmm. sort of, every now and then it, it it's a sort of um, a byproduct of being successful, but it was I never wanted I never wanted to be famous. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be known. Interesting. So then, I guess regarding fame, obviously, you are Norman Cook, and then you're as a performer, like you mentioned before, you are Fat Boy Slim. Do you find that this binary ever creates? I feel like there's no other way to say this. Like almost an identity crisis, or have you ever dealt with? No, no. The only no. There's two different people. There's Norman Cook and there's Fat Boy Slim. Yeah. And Norman Cook's a 60-year-old responsible father <laughs> of two um, who cares about the world. And, and Fatboy Slim's an ir irresponsible party yeah. idiot who thinks he's 17 and thinks he can do what a 17-year-old does. And it's quite good for me to separate the two. Yeah. And I, I, I never take Norman on stage with me because he's way too sensible. And I try and keep Fatboy Slim out of my day-to-day -day routine because he's completely irresponsible. <laughs> and But there's a rude, there's a, like a, a, a ritual where, a bit like, um, Clark Kent going into the phone box. Oh, really? Basically, yeah, when I put on the Hawaiian shirt and I take my shoes off. Oh, transformation? And yeah, and I have three Red Bulls and my tour manager, Alan, slaps me. Oh, really yeah, hard. I was actually And then I come, out as, I come out as a different person. And it, but it's great because when the gigs ended, I could take yeah. the uniform off and then I come back and have a quiet cup of tea and go to sleep and, you know, and, and I don't party yeah. all night like I used to. The only times I've had problems yeah, yeah. Was, in, was when I was younger and I didn't know where... Norman ended and Fatboy Slim began. Oh, so you've worked with so many amazing creatives and artists in your life, musicians. Um, is there a common thread that you see through all of these people? Is there a common characteristic that all of these creatives share? Ooh, interesting question. Um, only really that, that they don't take themselves too seriously. Interesting. And I don't mean they're like 
you know, they, they, it's all a big joke to them. It's, it's people who understand that what they're doing is creating fantasy and art and it's not real. I think the, the people that I've met in the music industry that, that I haven't got on with are the ones that actually believe in, <laughs> in the bollocks that we sell. I see. And but all the people that I've uh, it, it it tends to be the more successful people are the cooler they are, and the nicer they are because they didn't get where they were without being nice and cool. Yeah. And it's the kind of the people on the way up who can be a oh, bit. Oh, a bit uh, deeper. But I've worked. I'm. I've worked with some of the most fabulous, like David Byrne and and Bootsy Collins and Iggy oh Pop and people like that. So cool. The, and they're they're all you know. People say you should meet your heroes. I say you should, and you should have them come live around your house for a few <laughs> days because it's fabulous. Because they are really are. They're just people who are very talented, but also very beautiful souls, and mm-hmm. but very um, inquisitive and. You know, sort of questioning about how we can make the world a better place Lovely. by painting it a slightly different colour. My final question, and obviously this would have to be something that is able to be broadcast, but what is your wildest rave story or the wildest thing that you've seen at a rave that can be shared? Pretty much none of them can be shared. Oh, no. I saw I saw some stuff at Manumission. I used to work at a club called Manumission in Ibiza, and oh, that cool. was like the that was like the last days of the Roman Empire, <laughs> like f- just naked women and drugs and dwarves and yeah. Wow. That and I probably well no someone remind me of a story that, uh, uh, Ooh, that I'm uh, from Manumission. Yeah, yeah. They said you were DJing in the back room of Manumission at about seven in the morning. And a bloke came through with a bag of potatoes and he was giving potatoes out to everyone <laughs> on the dance floor. So they, said, so they said, he gave you a potato and you did, hardly looked up from DJing. You said, thanks, took the potato <laughs> and then you put it on the record that was playing and carried on mixing with the potatoes spinning around on the record that you were playing. And later that, yeah. that guy was, got me on Instagram and he said, oh, and I'm coming to the show tonight, you know, 25 years later, yeah. I'm still coming, coming to see you. And during the show, somebody lobbed something on, on, on stage. And then and I saw it, and I thought it was an egg, and I looked, and it was, he'd thrown me a potato. No way! <laughs> Amazing! I, I guess it was yeah. I, I'm assuming it was him. <laughs> it's so just I like just, a trend. I just picked it up and put it on the CGJ and made it go no around way. again. Well, thank you so, so much for speaking with us. This has honestly been amazing. So, it's, well, it's so a pleasure. Thank you so much. Like I said, I, like I was telling you before, yeah. when, I, when I was a student, I, uh, I used to do a fanzine and I used to um, find out the record company's phone numbers and phone them up and say, can I interview so and so? <laughs> and some people were gracious enough to do it and it really, I, I've always remembered that. Yeah. And it set me on my path to where I am today. So oh, I hope it does you. the same oh, for you. Thank you so much. It's and been you. so lovely speaking so with you. Thank you so much.